to a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am here sitting down with the UCP candidate for leader, Brian Jean. And there's a large title that I need to get through here. He is the current MLA for Fort McMurray, Lac La Biche. He is running for the UCP leadership and ultimately running to be the next premier of this great province. Brian, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Honor is mine, Chris. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, Brian, let's get the first question that I've asked every politician from school board trustee all the way up to Senate on the record. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Brian? You know, I would say it started at first because it seemed the right thing to do, but then it became obvious that it was necessary. And, you know, the fire in Fort McMurray made it very clear that leadership matters. The flood... Uh, that happened after that that many people didn't hear about it leadership matters it it matters to people and uh, i think i'm the right person for the job to understand what needs to be done and how to get it done and and for me it truly is a sense of duty i want to do this because i believe i'm the best person the most capable person the most experienced person to lead alberta through the turmoil that we've got right now with the rest of the world and canada in particular and do so in a sensible balanced way that respects the rule of law that is mature and that gets the best results and outcomes because you know often i find that people that jump up and down and wave signs around don't really get outcomes they get they get attention but they really don't get results and they certainly don't get positive results you you left politics you retired in 2017 2018 and then uh, you recently made a comeback you saw the state of what was happening in the province of Alberta with the lockdowns with COVID-19, and you ran, won the by-election for McMurray Lac La Biche. What made you want to come back? What made you decide that now is the time that you have to come back because what you see in the province is not the, what the province that you want? Well, what I was mostly worried about is the NDP coming back, and that's why I got involved again. And, you know, I saw, I, I listen, when I left politics, I left because of personal reasons, my my mom and my sister died shortly thereafter. I had to take over the family businesses. My son had just died. I had three estates to deal with and a whole bunch of businesses and people. And um, I left believing that I'd left it in great hands because Jason Kenney and I, of course, started it together. And I, I had the best hopes for him. People said, oh, no, you don't. Well, yes, I did because my businesses, my family in Fort McMurray, and it's a huge family, all of us would have done much better if Jason Kenney would do better. But then I you know, saw the first year roll by and a series of mistakes and before COVID. And then I saw the next year roll by and I couldn't believe that we were locked down. I have to tell you, I was shocked about that. Um, oh, just the way we were, just it, there was lack of communication, la- lack of transparency, lack of, la- lack of the reason why instead of this is what you have to do instead of, listen, folks, I, I believe government is there to, to be transparent and to bring good actions to people based upon their understanding of the circumstances, not just blind trust. Um, sorry, I saw the shock in your face, Chris, and no, I was just like... It, it was an interesting statement because because the media reports, and you know you should never trust exactly what the media says. Like, never there are do. some good reports, but except me, exactly. But there are there were media reports that, oh, you were disgruntled, so that's why you left. But you're telling mm-hmm. a different side of the story here, and I think there's not a lot of people who know that side of the story. Jason Kenney and I worked together for 10 years. Our policies, I don't remember them misaligning at all. I, I was a parliamentary secretary. I did my duty. I did my role. I, I did a great job, I thought, um, and I was very proud of what I did. I was involved and allocated a $1 billion green infrastructure fund, passed you know more than two dozen pieces of legislation that I was appoint man for the, the government for. I felt very good about it, but uh, during that period of time, that was the duty part I was referring to earlier. Like I felt like, you know, I retired when I was 41 from the practice of law. I'd practiced for 10 years and, and in Fort McMurray, and I, I retired. And I thought, you know, what better opportunity than to be a member of Parliament and serve the people of Alberta. And so, you know, flying back and forth to Fort McMurray every weekend was not a lot of fun, I have to be honest. Uh, But I worked hard and, you know, I got sick of it near the end for a variety of reasons, mostly what was going on with Ottawa. And I felt like I could see the money pouring out uh, in that direction and I didn't like it. And I didn't see a lot of things being done. And I left politics after 10 years, as I said, I was going to leave politics. So my expectation when I left provincial politics was Jason Kenney was going to be the best guy ever and best premier we ever had. And then, you know, first year, second year, COVID, third year, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, we're going to lose the next election. We need to renew the UCP. And I don't know if you remember, but the very first time I announced I was going to run in the by-election and for the nomination, I said, we need to renew the, the party. And if we don't renew the party, we're not going to win the next election against the NDP. And for me, conservative policy is better policy. Now I'm not talking the hard, hard, fast, 
uh, policy that infringes on people's lives, because there is some of that on both sides of the, the political spectrum. I'm talking about, you know, private enterprise, freedoms, uh, opportunities for people, uh, making sure that people have the opportunity to keep more money in their pockets than government. I, I usually find that people make better decisions spending their money than government officials do. Uh, and I just find that government officials spend a lot of money and, and they don't do it very wisely. So why not you know, send it back where it really belongs, in my opinion? And, and anyways, that's, that's what I believe. So I wanted to come back and renew the party. We're going to talk about some policy issues in a few seconds, but I want to stick on to this whole uh, renewing the UCP. You're traveling across this province right now. You were just down in Lethbridge. You were up in Leduc, and you're heading back to Fort McMurray literally after this interview. I am. What are you hearing from people across this province right now? Um, when I talk to people, and this is just my inner circle, and this is that's the microcosm that is our world right now, is we only talk to usually people that are around us. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing different things from different parts of this province? And are you shocked about what you're hearing about this province when you're talking about renewing the UCP to potentially stop the NDP in 2023? I am. It, it was definitely more regional at the start of the party, at the start of the race. Um, and there, the opinions and beliefs of each person, I think, was more of a regional uh, decision then but now it's starting to you know people are starting to talk and communicate and, and speak about the fact of each candidate and what they bring to the table and I think you'll find some of the candidates are more attractive to some particular organizations and groups than others um, <clears throat> you know I think uh, there's a lot of anger out there you know we have a lot of anger out there and I feel for those people but anger needs to be controlled in order to get good outcomes and emotion needs to be controlled in order to get positive results and we need to have a clear direction and and I think there's no question that you know there's a portion of the Alberta population that are dissatisfied with confederation right now and I would really like to solve that I think Canada is broken but I believe I can fix it along with the help of all the Albertans that are so optimistic to get it fixed and I, and I say to them that say oh there's not a problem I, there is a problem there is an issue here and we need to fix it and how we fix it is we be accountable we be transparent we sit down at the table we use the rules there's rules out there. The rules are called Section 46 of the Constitution. It's very clear what's there and what path to go forward on. Uh, Quebec did it, and they had a referendum, and it failed. Uh, but we had a referendum, and it, and it succeeded here in Alberta. It was a referendum to say, not we're going to leave, but listen, we believe something's broken here, and we want to fix it. It's just a tool to open the Constitution. That's all equalization is. That's why we brought it up you know, as leader five years ago or six years ago now, because once we open that, we get to talk about the Senate. We get to talk about the House of Commons and why we don't have one person, one vote here in, in Canada. Some provinces, it's three to one compared to Alberta. Um, we can talk about how we get our products uh, and services across to the world because that's protected under our current agreement and there should, be a, there should be a result if they don't allow us. And that result should be at least, at the very least, that they're cut off equalization. You know, there's a number of things that we need to tackle. I, I reach out to my followers on social media and I ask them, what would you ask Brian Jean if you sat down with him tomorrow? And it goes in line of what you're talking about, fixing confederation. Because I think a lot of people understand that confederation is broken right now. We, we, we're truly not really a country. We're regions of a country. We don't ever talk about things that are unifying us and we need to. But We do, I agree. One of the things that kept on coming up over and over again was how do you, that autonomy for Albertans, getting a fairer deal, getting confederation fixed, getting a fair shot for Alberta differ from the Sovereignty Act that your opponent, Danielle Smith, has been putting forward. Because there's a lot of people who are saying, is there any difference or is it just more of the same from different po two different politicians? I appreciate that. It is a different tact. So as you notice, my slogan, which is right behind you now, people might not, might not be able to see, but it looks good. Autonomy for Alberta. Can, oh, there you perfect. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Autonomy for all Albertans, that's not about erecting walls. It's not about, you know, creating problems with our economy and making it not stable so people won't invest in it. It's about giving more opportunities. Freedom of choice is what autonomy is. That's freedom of choice. You know, the, the, the decision should be yours on what your priorities are and, and what you do with your life. And that's why I say autonomy for Albertans is about not just my body, my choice, which I think is very important for people to understand, especially today, but also the opportunities of autonomy for my community. If I'm a Christian or an unbeliever or gay or whatever the case is, I should have autonomy to have my community go forward my way 
my priority way for my community. And if you're Sikh or Christian or an unbeliever, you should have the opportunity to celebrate as you see fit. Also, financial autonomy. Think about it. There's a lot of talk about the WEF and, and conspiracy theory or not. I believe in individual ownership. I think that the opportunity to own businesses and vehicles and have wealth is a very good thing for the individual, not for the companies or the corporations or for government. You know, our government is, is rich right now. But I also think about professional autonomy. There's some, you know, frankly, some professions out there that should have their own act, that should have their own opportunity to act for the best interest of Albertans. Can and that's what people forget. Oh, I can give you lots. How about notary publics? How about uh, how about some of the engineering professions that are right now under a peg and want to be different than that? Is there a reason why they should be? Sometimes there is reasons because one size does not fit all. Just like what's right for Calgary's community is not right for Edmonton. It's not right for Fort McMurray. If you're going to tell me the healthcare system is working, I'm going to tell you that, wow, it's broken like crazy and I want to fix it. I'm passionate about it because I lost my son to healthcare. And, you know, we have to fix that. That's autonomy. Healthcare autonomy. We need to have the opportunity to seek the health care we want. Does that mean prevention? Well, for me, I, you know, I work out. I take a lot of vitamins. I sometimes am under the care of a naturopath. I believe in, in the opportunity to seek knowledge from other people about what I can do best for my body. And I definitely read it but I, um, before I take it. But I am a person that believes in prevention rather than cure as being a big thing that our society ignores. And people that want to have that opportunity should have that opportunity. I'm going to play in the sandbox with you for a few oh, minutes. Oh. I know. It's, it's always hard when you... Um, I'm going to get a shovel. <laughs> yeah. Um, you talked about health care. Let's talk about health care. Um, for my listeners who are watching this, who are listening to this, they know that I have struggled with cancer. I have secondary glioblastoma on my brain, and there are good days and there are bad days. And this is a good day right now. This is a good day where I can actually remember who I'm sitting and talking to. Will I remember tomorrow? I don't know. And I've gone through radiation, I've gone through treatment, and things aren't positive right now, let's put it that way. I'm so sorry. One of your fellow candidates made a statement that I think a lot of people took offense to. As someone who has seen the ugly side of cancer, as mm -hmm. my family is going through right now, Ricardo is struggling because he's lost family members to cancer as well as particularly a brain tumor, which I have. I'm so is sorry. It, is it fair to question the statements that politicians make, especially those who are running for leader? You know, when you say things, you have to be accountable for it. And sometimes you say things, and I've said things, I've said one thing that I'm ashamed of to this day, even though I apologized immediately for it. But you need to apologize. And, you know, saying that somebody's responsible for their own cancer... Completely, and I did not want to start this because I knew before we started this interview, I asked Brian if it was okay to talk about this, and we both said we probably could both cry. But actually, you said, "Is it okay to talk? Is any topic off the table?" And I said, "No." <laughs> and then, you, and then you said this one, and I said, "Yeah, well, I'm probably going to cry." So we, I lost my son to cancer, and then my sister, and then my mom. I've I have I started my process my uh, treatments in September. In February, sorry, in September of 2020, I apologize, my mind is not the best right now. And there are days when you go into the hospital and there's people that you get a connection with because you see the friendly faces and then you hear stories about them losing battles. Our healthcare system is broken right now. It's a disaster. I was one of these people who had their surgery canceled last year because we went into a lock, not a lockdown, but we, we canceled elective surgeries. You're fighting to get autonomy. You're fighting because of people like myself who have had had their surgeries canceled, but I did get it rescheduled uh, in December of 2021, and I'm here right now. How do we fix their healthcare system that you have seen the ugly side of, and Albertans across this province are seeing the ugly side of every single day who are battling cancer, who are battling heart attacks, who are on life support in the province right now and that means the backlog is being created you know the first thing we do is we recognize that nurses and doctors are the pillars of our community and we um, we treat them better we treat them with respect and the healthcare profession is one of those things that I think that feels 
the lack of love from our government, and we have to stop making them feel that way. I don't have any problem with our healthcare professionals being paid the best in the world. I just think we need to get the same outcomes, and that's what we're missing right now. We have the money, we just don't have the results. What I want to do is, the first thing I want to do is make sure that we immediately staff the hospitals. So I, I will tell you a little secret about policy is I'm a policy guy. I love great ideas and innovative ideas because I'm a business person by background. I'm sure I was a lawyer and I was a politician, but business was my thing. My family is full of serial entrepreneurs and, and I believe that what we can do is so much for the healthcare system based upon making sure that we focus on what's happening in other jurisdictions. In Germany, we have a, a home care system that keeps people at home longer. Seniors want to stay at home longer. That saves them 90% per patient and it's a mobile unit. Makes a lot of sense to me. We need to take our nurse practitioners and there's 700 of them in Alberta. We need to immediately put them in the field and open our hospitals across this province. We have hospitals closed on weekends. They're closed uh, some permanently. The emergency department, for instance, in the biggest oil reserve in, I think, North America, Hardesty, is closed now. Um, I just was there a couple days ago. It's un unacceptable. And we have nurse practitioners that are ready to go and do what they were trained to do. They just need a legislative change, and we can do that within a matter of a day. So there's things like that. Right now, nurses, for instance, you know, there's so much overtime out there. The overtime is 120% of their current salary, which means we're, we could actually give them a 10% raise and uh, double the amount of nurses, and we'd still be saving a little bit of money. You know, like, they're just doing it incorrectly. We need to make sure that we take our our MRI machines and our other assets that belong to the people of Alberta and our hospitals and get them full, which many of them are not, uh, get them working, which many of them are not, and get these machines working on a, on a productive basis. Anybody that invested that in the private sector would have th those machines operating, you know, all day, every day if they could. And we need to be in a situation where we start treating people with respect and we focus on their positive outcomes instead of just looking at them as a number or a machine coming in. We really need to think about what goes out and money has to follow the patient as well. We, we saw the healthcare system inundated over the last two years. Nurses are tired, doctors are tired. You see report after report of doctors closing up their family uh, practices and leaving the province because how they feel like they've been treated over the last few years. Um, how do you work with the doctors unions, the nurses unions, and bring them back to the table and say, how can we start fresh? How can we work together, not just for you, but for all Albertans? Because I think, and I, I hate to be the, I hate this show to be about the healthcare, but it's a topic because right now in Airdrie, their emergency room just got closed down. And I know. Opened up again, but. Doctors are overrun and they're taking their bags and leaving this province in droves. How do we get them back? There's no silver bullet, but there's a number of things that we can do. Nurse practitioners, number one. We can get those people working immediately as they should be. We can get our nurses back by making sure they're paid well and they're, they're not burnt out by working all the overtime. We need to make sure that our doctors are trained here in Alberta and we do rural training of rural Albertans that are already here. So I say to you this, it's a multi-pronged approach. The first thing we have to do is make sure our colleges and our universities are for Albertans. That means if you get an 85% and somebody from Toronto gets a 99% and you both want to be doctors and there's one place in Alberta, the Albertan gets it. And I know that's not the traditional model, but right now we have to change things. And we have to make Albertans feel like, you know, their son or daughter in rural Alberta or in Calgary or in Edmonton should have a priority over that position of that placement or that educational opportunity. I think it makes a lot of sense. And then they should be brought into the hospitals here and service what they want to do, which is serve Albertans. Most of these people in rural Alberta want to stay in Alberta, but they can't get their education here. Even in Alberta, they can't get their education, and then they can't get their residency. That has to change. It has to change for doctors. It has to change for nurses. It has to change for veterinarians. It has to change for a lot of professions right now where there's a huge demand, but not enough output. Again, it's about output. It's about getting better quality output for people. I, I want to turn to another subject right now because we could probably spend a good three hours on healthcare just mm -hmm. in itself, but I want to talk about rural crime and crime in particular. Um, in Calgary, we're seeing crime rates spike. 
we are seeing uh, rural crime being a major issue for some smaller communities. Um, the provincial government has started their uh, campaign to, which you're a part of, uh, started their campaign to implement a potential implementation of a provincial police force. Yeah, but don't blame me for that part. No, I will. I will not blame you. <laughs> I believe you in that. autonomy. I don't believe in a one. You know. Okay, so what would you do? What would a Premier Brian Jean do to help tackle rural crime? Mm. And would you implement a provincial police force in Alberta tomorrow if you were elected? Well, the number one thing I would do is work on our economy. Because when our economy is better, when we have more jobs, people don't commit crimes. The other thing I'd do is look at opportunities for youth. I was a lawyer for 10 years, as you know, and for a good portion of that time, I saw people go through my office door and a lot of that time they were you know young people between the ages of 15 and 20 that uh, committed the crimes especially the property crimes we have to find other things for them to do like jobs so that's the first thing but no I would not uh, implement a provincial police force and make it one size fits all we already have city police in Edmonton city police in Calgary we have city police in Lethbridge um, Tabor I think has it uh, there's Cochrane there's other city police, and I think the opportunity for them to have the choice of the type of policing they want is the most important, i.e. autonomy. I believe that freedom of choice is what they need. So if it's Calgary that wants a provincial police force, well, should the provincial government start one so that people have options? That doesn't mean that it goes right across the province. That just means it's a provincial police force that might provide them options. But they can do that now. They can tie into Lethbridge. They can tie into Calgary if they want to. I'm sure we can find the opportunity for them to work together to find the best model for them. I know there's some areas of the province right now that want to get rid of the RCMP. I, I don't blame them in, in High River because of what happened there. There's a stigma of, you know, the, the fact that somebody would break in the front my front door and kick it in. And the fact that it would be a police officer is unacceptable, and that should not happen. And I still think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered on that, and I'd like to have that opportunity to do that. Because if you can't trust your police, we're all in big trouble. That's called, you know, the next step is anarchy. But the RCMP, there are going to be 500 officers in, in Alberta, no matter what happens, because they're federal officers. They're going to come in and do federal stuff. They have access to CSIS. They have access to all the things that we don't want to have to pay for as Albertans on top of what we already pay in taxes. So what I think we should do is just have the option. And if... If the cities want to have a different police force, let them have it. If they want to have the RCMP, which is a, frankly, a premium police force, I, I've heard as much as 250,000 plus per officer per year. Well, then they can do that. But let's have choice. And and as a premier, I would provide freedom of choice and opportunities to choose because that's it goes along with the conservative value too. You know, leaving more money in your pocket so you can have the opportunity to choose. And that's what it would be about for me. So keep the RCMP. Yeah. And if they want them, use them. And if they don't move to a different model, which is readily avail available now. I, I, you seem to be about giving people choice, and especially rural municipalities' choices, or even urban uh, municipalities' choices. But as the province, you have to unify. You have to bring everyone together, because the people in Agreed. Madison Hat will be talking about their issue, but up in Peace River, they'll be talking about a different issue. And if you go to Jasper, you talk to Albertans, they're going to be talking about a completely different issue. How do you do it? How do you unify the party, unify the province to put their best foot forward? Autonomy is great, but when everyone has a different definition of what autonomy they want, how would you be able to bring it together and put it into one cohesive message so when you go to Ottawa, go talk to Justin Trudeau or uh, Prime Minister Pierre Polyev if he wins the leadership in the next election, how do you do that? Well, first of all, I think through autonomy. Autonomy is the tool that gets us that. I, I want Albertans to be the happiest, the healthiest, the most free, and most prosperous people on the planet. That's that's my motto. That's been my motto for a long time. So that's how do you how do you get to be happy? Well, freedom gives you happiness. How do you get to be happy? Well, healthcare gives you good healthcare gives you happiness. Prosperity gives you happiness. All these things are tied together. Autonomy gets you that. Why? Well, you said it yourself. You said, well, up up there in High Prairie, it doesn't fit the same thing as Calgary. You're right. So High Prairie can make their decision for them, and Calgary can make their decision for them. And what my job is is to provide them options, just like the people of Alberta. And remember, I want more autonomy for Albertans inside Canada. Now, that don't limit yourself here. You know if you live in PEI or Newfoundland, you can get unemployment insurance much quicker than you can here in Alberta uh, in the same job. That's not right. I want to challenge that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take them to court over that. I'm going to take them to court over the tanker ban. I've sued people hundreds of times, probably thousands. Um, it's not a dirty word for me. I mean, sometimes you just have to stick up for yourself. And, and uh, you know, sending a nasty letter just doesn't work. Sometimes you have to just take them to court. And we have a Supreme Court of Canada that is our referee. And, and frankly, I 
think that they're going to rule on our side. You know why? Because most of them are Quebecers, and they can't set a precedent that they won't be able to follow. And I'm not saying separation. I'm talking about, you know, unemployment insurance, a separate program here if they're not going to play ball with us. I'm talking to separate pension here. We already can over-contribute to those. We'll have a separate pension. I think our seniors should get twice as much money as what they're getting now. With a separate pension, we'd be paying the same amount of money in, and they'd be paid twice as much. Why wouldn't Alberta seniors? That's about Alberta. Albertans receiving more autonomy for themselves in Canada. Any right that's available outside of Alberta should be available to Albertans too. You, you talked about the Supreme Court, and yet again, I'll play in that sandbox as well because I, I love when the guests. New appointment today. Uh, exactly. Very uh, happy to see that. Ontario, which is great. Indigenous um, woman. Indigenous woman. Very as happy well. to see that. Um, we'll talk about Indigenous uh, collaboration here in a few seconds, but I want to talk about uh, Ottawa. The Supreme Court has ruled against Alberta twice already with the C-69, I believe, and then the carbon tax mm -hmm. and said carbon tax is allowed. The, provincial government, the federal government has the right to do that. What do you th why do you think the, federal, the Supreme Court would be different in a challenge to the Constitution, whether it be about pension, whether it be about uh, equalization? Where do you think they would be able to side with us without giving a fair shot oh. to... Well, that's exactly why I want to open up the Constitution, because we're going to be talking about those things. We've got to bring them to the table and talk about them. Do you them. think a Premier Legault would want to, though? Absolutely. Really? Oh, man. Have you seen the health care transfers from the federal government and their expectations? They don't line up. One-third you know, funding and two-thirds expectation? It's ridiculous. The, the, same as the pipeline. Why do you think so many provinces appealed the pipeline ban with, with Alberta? You know why? Because it's infringing on their jurisdiction. It's a Section 91, Section 92 jurisdiction. People think we're somehow subservient to the federal government. we got a cow to, to what Trudeau says. It's not true. We're partners. And in a partnership, you don't abuse the other partner. You don't take all their money and leave them destitute. And that's how we feel in Fort McMurray. I know that they feel that way in Cold Lake and Lac La Biche. They don't feel like they're getting their fair share. Really? Really. We don't feel like the federal government responds to our needs in, in the immigration file, on our temporary foreign worker file. file. We, is we this feel just a Trudeau thing, or is this a thing that's been going on for some time? Because It's building. Uh, it's been building. Is it? It's okay, because building. that's the one thing I've always wanted to ask somebody. Because Listen, I'm, I'm not a separatist. You need to know that, no, too. No, exactly. I, I would not imagine you are, because you're running for a, a great province, and you're running for autonomy. And I want to help fix the issues. Two different things. Yeah, they are. But... I like to think of it as autonomy and sovereignty are two separate things. Yeah. But, you know. The federal government is implementing tanker bans. They're, they bought a pipeline, which if, if you talk to any liberal and they'll say, well, we bought a pipeline. <laughs> so <laughs> where's the pipeline today? You show me the money. I mean oil. <laughs> so why do you think you can do it? Why do you think you were the best person to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Justin Trudeau? on October 7th, once this leadership race is over? I don't think it's about going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Justin Trudeau. I think it's... Yeah. A, no, I, I look at it a little differently. I think it's about <clears throat> looking at the situation we're in. We're in a, an agreement. There's 11 parties to this agreement, 10 provinces and the federal government. And that agreement is not working. And it hasn't been working since it, its inception, but it took a while to figure out that it's not working. And that's not that long ago. And it came up, you know, all the, the points came up in the terms of agreement by people, just like you and me. And we've tried it for a while and it doesn't work and some provinces really don't like it and other provinces don't like it. And what we need to do is sit down at the table and have a discussion, section 46 and, and the Supreme Court of Canada, by the way, laid out specifically the path that we need to follow. And that's why I came up with the equalization referendum. That's why Jason Kenney implemented the equalization referendum. I don't know why he didn't send a section 46 legal notice to Ottawa or the other premiers. I'm not sure why he didn't do that. Maybe he was busy doing other things, but I'm going to do that. I, I said I'd do it on day one and I want to do that because we it's the path that's set down by the people, you know, the Lawheeds and others that wrote the constitution for us. Um, we need to sit down and have the opportunity to refine it. And if it's either going to be refined or else we're going to have to start throwing tools um, into the mix and the tools we have are, are big and people don't think we do have big tools but we do and, and why do I think I'm the right person? Well, I litigated for 10 years. I've been sued, I've sued, I've sat in the courts, I've been in the provincial court every day some weeks, the Court of Queen's Bench lots and did lots of different applications at many different levels, Court of Appeal here in Alberta. Um, I understand that part of it but I also owned and operated a, you know, a number of businesses uh, and I'm 
And you know the inside I of know. Ottawa. And That's what I was going to say. I know you don't like Ottawa people sometimes, but I spent 10 years there, and I worked hard because I thought I could change it. I thought, I when I was in Ottawa, I actually thought, flying back and forth, that I was actually doing great things. And I was economically. I was involved in Canada's economic action plan, very involved as a PS and, and doling things out. It was My ministry was called the Ministry of Everything, and during that period of time I was there, six years, I actually had four ministers that went through that portfolio. So they didn't change me, they changed the minister. Um, so I was doing something right, but I, I got tired of it because I just saw the same thing and it didn't seem to change. You know, the NCC, the National Capital uh, Commission region has like $300, 000, $300 million a year to, to spend in Ottawa. And I'm just thinking, the, honestly, I was thinking about the men and women that work in Fort McMurray, 12 hours a day. Oh, we want to turn to Indigenous and then we'll wrap okay. up here because I know you have to get to your wife because it is your anniversary today. So happy anniversary. Thanks. But yeah. I, I probably shouldn't be in Calgary for this. <laughs> you know, hey, it's a campaign. <laughs> yeah. She probably knows as a, for, as a spouse of a former politician, I know. <laughs> you do. Politics comes first. Um, indigenous issues. My daughter comes first. There you go. Always. Your daughter comes she first. She always does. Um, that's why I'm doing this. And Indigenous issues. How do you partner with Indigenous communities <sighs> to get benefits for them but also all our burdens because we are still seeing report after report it may not be newsworthy anymore but undiscovered graves of children who were murdered by residential schools and we need to work with our indigenous communities to be economically beneficial to them but also economically beneficial to all of us. How do you how do you partner with our indigenous communities and how have you done in the past that would give you a leg up compared to some of the other candidates? Well, it just so happens being from Fort McMurray, I have about twenty five nieces and nephews that are indigenous and uh, and to be honest, uh, probably six or seven were born on reserves in Fort McMurray from three different reserves. And uh, you know, I've seen them, you know, the educational process and the different challenges they have and I would say to you this, that what I've seen over the last 20 years in Fort McMurray is a, a role model situation for Indigenous reserves and, and Métis nations and other areas. They're doing very well, and that to me is goes back to one of the first things I told you about, which is the economy and stopping crime and creating wealth usually is the great equalizer. And I have seen, even in my own nephew, to give you one example, my nephew is about just 44 now, and, and he lived on the streets for probably two or three years, did some time at Drumheller and some other places. I know that because I was actually his lawyer a couple times until I realized I couldn't work for family anymore. Um, but, you know, he has three pages of rap sheet, but he went through the reserve situation, and and uh, right now he's got a great job. He's got an incredible wife and five, you know, great kids, and he's going to, I think one of his kids is going to go be a, a professional hockey player, NHL. I'm hoping to see it on the back of the Edmonton Oilers or the Calgary Flames. Um, that'd be great for me. Do you give more autonomy to our First Nations as Absol well? Absolutely. Autonomy is for all Albertans, and there are Albertans, and I can I can think of no better place in the wealth to be than right here in Alberta. With whichever Albertan wants to uh, be, be successful, I'm happy to help them do, do so, exactly that. And I think the wealth of, you know, our oil and gas industry belongs to Albertans. Our, uh, our agriculture industry belongs to Albertans. Let's make it for Albertans, and indigenous members of Alberta should thrive. I'm, I want to find programs that help our Métis nations and our indigenous reserves on how we can get more industry on reserves and how we can take the torrent system of land and offer that to them as a land registration system that will actually change history in the future because land has been the one thing and the registration system has been one thing that has set you know, the first world apart from the rest of the world because we have the security of law and we understand the uh, issue of land and how much wealth it can bring to the rest of us. And I want to offer options to the Indigenous communities, options that I think will see the successful implementation of all of us being one people, which is not does not mean we forget who we are. Exactly the opposite. I believe all of us as individuals make for a better people and the colorfulness of all of our cultures and especially that... Twenty of them are, are treaty Indians, so you know when I go hunting, I actually have to get the tag, and and they don't, which is kind of nice for them. But um, I do understand them uh, as well as I think any any person from my cultural background could, because they are part of my family, and I love them very much. And I think if we just are a little bit more patient and understand that, you know, rising tides lift all boats, we can all lift our boats together and be the healthiest, the wealthiest, the most free, and most prosperous people on the planet. planet.
And that's what I'm going to work towards. My last question to you, Brian, before we leave here is memberships have closed. Yes, they have. Ballots are going to be printed off and we start sending here. You're going to be out there knocking on doors, hitting the pavement as much as you possibly can over the next month and a half, almost two months. Oh, well, a month and a half. I'm going to leave with this last question. I think you've already answered it, but I want you to say it again. Why you? Why should people put their faith in you on that first ballot, first choice, to put Brian Jean in the Premier's chair on October 7th? You can only tell the future by the past. And how people behave in the past is 99% of the time how they're going to behave in the future. And people can trust me. They trusted me in the fire. They trusted me in the flood. They trusted me as the leader of the opposition for three years. And during that period of time, I united a party that was very fractious. Nobody left. Nobody quit my caucus. Everybody stayed together. And I think right now we need somebody to unify not just the party members and not just caucus, but all Albertans. And I'm a unifier. I'm a person that believes in building and empowering people to be better for themselves, not for me. I'm not going to steal people's money or be untrustworthy. I am the person that they can trust with their purse, and I'm the person they can trust with their life. I will not infringe upon their life. I will give them autonomy, and I think that's what they want. But the most important thing, I think, is for sure trust. But I listen, and listening gives you the ability to understand what people want. And that's what I wanted to deliver for them. That's why I say, you know, happy, healthy, free, and prosperous. That's what I want for myself and my life and my family. I have a three and a half year old, and I have a 38 year old, and, and a 33 year old. And I love kids, and I love families, and I love our future because it can be very bright. We just have to recognize that Albertans are different, and our differences are what make us great. Well, Brian, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. I know we barely scratched the surface of what's going on in Alberta, but I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your business schedule to sit down and answer some of these questions. But I'm assuming, because as everything else, you are able to answer other questions that Albertans have, UCP members have, and you, they can do that through their, your website, I'm assuming? Absolutely. Uh, Brian at briangene.ca. Send me a message on email. It takes me a little bit of time because I'm getting a lot of messages, to be honest. But I do get back to everybody. That's something I've prided myself. I, you know, one time, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but one time I had a, a lady that was an NDP member at uh, a debate say to me that she voted for me um, because I always got back to her. Aww. Hey, it, you know what? I, 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 people know I've ran federally for provincial mm -hmm. uh, federal party. I have no allegiance to anything right now because I think they're. I'm, I'm, in, I'm one of those Albertans that are dis, not disgusted, but upset with the state of politics. Today. Disillusion would be a good way to put it. Disillusion. There's the word. Thank you. I feel the same way. Because I don't think people talk anymore. I want people to start talking. And that's where the show came from is I just want to have a conversation with people because social media does nothing, nothing good in this world. Well, I liked what you said earlier and I, I use that in a lot of speeches. You know, we should talk about what brings us together yeah. instead of what tears us apart. And let's focus on becoming a bigger community and a better community. You know, all of us together because we are in it together. We are. I want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening to us, to us live by our Thanks. website tonight. Uh, greatly appreciate the Brian for sitting Thanks, down and talking. If you want to reach out to Brian, the links to his uh, website, his social media, Facebook page, and Twitter are in the show notes. So scroll down, send him a message. He would, I'm assuming, he would I be will. happy. As he said, he has prided himself to try to get answer all the questions. <laughs> so throw them at him, uh, people, because he's happy to answer them. Brian, yeah. thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. And thank you for putting it on. It's great to have the communication. It really is. Well, thank you. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to remind everyone, get it from behind social media, and just to have a conversation with somebody that helps our society, that helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.